Okay, it's time. So, I now I'd like to introduce our next guest, Dan Vatil, so let everyone give him a big round of applause. Dan's been a maintainer in KD for ages, working on on Akinadi, Pym, and all sorts of places throughout the stack. And now he's going to talk to us about C++ coroutines and Qt. So, hello. Thank you uh, for the introduction, David. Uh, so, my name is Daniel. I've been working in on with C++ and Kitty for almost uh, over a decade now. And, uh, well, lately I found interest in digging into interesting new features in the C++ language. So that's why I'm here today talking about coroutines and uh, about Qt. Uh, word of warning before I begin. Uh, coroutines are a bit of a complex topic to explain. So uh, there's a lot of things to talk about and not enough time. and uh, also, there is a lot of code in this presentation, so you have been warned. I'm not kidding. The first slide already, if I can switch. Yes, I can switch. The first slide already is a piece of code, because I think that's the best way how to explain what coroutines actually give us and what they are useful for. So uh, let's get into it. Uh, what do we have here? So um, we, have a fun we have a simple regular function, as you know. It's a member function called get title that returns a Q string. What does the function do? Well, it creates a Dbus interface so that it can talk to some remote service somewhere uh, else, uh, well, also in your computer, but still, it's local, so Dbus. Anyway, so we have the interface. Now, what we do is we do we call player.call, so we call some remote function called title in the remote service. Uh, then we just uh, convert the response to Q Dbus reply because that's how we can extract the the, the response, which is type of type Q string. And then, well, then th there is this thing, right? So one thing is we have QD bus reply on one on side, and then we have Q string on the other. How does the conversion happen? Well, QD bus reply does this magically. But the thing is now, I just said, well, we just did a remote call to a remote service. So we can't possibly have the Q string already available, right? It's a dbus, right? Uh, that thing does lots of things. So if you do a dbus call here in the player, dot call, what happens is your applications needs to create a message, send it to the dbus daemon, the dbus daemon must forward it to the actual service that you want to talk to, the service must process the request, calculate the response, send the response back to the daemon, and the daemon must forward the response back to you, you need to process it, and then finally you might have the queue string that you wanted, right? This all takes time. In most cases, you will just get away with doing this blocking call, because what this equal sign does, well, in this case, the operation behind that is when extracting the, the string from the QD bus reply, it will have to wait blocking. It will have to block the main thread and wait for the for the response to arrive so that we can extract the Q string and store it in the variable, right? So uh, in most cases, this will work just fine, right? It will take just a split of second. The users will not notice that you just did a blocking call in your main thread. The application will still seem responsive except when you are presenting your awesome application in, in front of a huge crowd of 200 people and your boss is looking at you and then suddenly you are standing in front of a screen and your application is frozen for 20 seconds because the remote service has crashed or is not responding for some reason. And now your application is doing a blocking call, so it's blocked. It's waiting for the dbus timeout to kick in and return an error instead of title. So you see, doing blocking calls in the main thread is not a good idea. So how can we fix this? Um, well, one option is we could do player dot call with callback, which would actually allow us to pass a callback that Qt would eventually call when uh, uh, it receives the response. This is a problem, though. The callback, in order to be able, then we would need to change the signature of the get title function, right? It would no longer return Q string; it would be void, and instead we would have to take some. Uh, uh, probably uh, another callback from the caller that we would then call with the actual uh, queue string that we got from the remote service. But then likely the caller might need to adjust their signature as well to take callback from their caller so that they can propagate the response, right? So this do, using a call with callback or, or queue dbus pending call watcher, which is a really long name for a really simple class that also does just wait uh, uh, waiting for, for a dbus reply, in both those cases, you would need to uh, fundamentally change your API, change your design, and it would propagate to more layers of your of your application, probably. Uh, so that's not really 
cool, right? Just because of this simple debug call, we don't want to have to re-engineer or enter API. So uh, what are the options? Well, one thing that you could do is you could create a nested queue event loop inside this function and wait for the reply to arrive. Then you stop the event loop and you return. So the signature of the function doesn't change. The function still looks like it's not blocking. It actually doesn't block your UI thread because the event loop will be running nested. But then using nested event loops, that's not that's not a good idea, really. Right? Don't, don't run nested event loops, especially if you're writing libraries. So, uh, what are the options? Well, let's let's see if coroutines can help. So this is the same function, except it's a coroutine now. Uh, let's see what has changed. So there are three things that have changed from the previous version. First is the return type. The return type now is qcoro task q string. Uh, let's not bother ourselves with what qcoro is or what task is. Just think that it's a it's a uh, return type that represents some sort of a asynchronous or pending operation, right? Then we have the call wait keyword, which is the the main thing here. The call await keyword, what it does, it uh, and then uh, I'll get to that later. And we have call return as well. Uh, we have call wait and call return. Call wait will wait for the reply to arrive. I'll dig into that later. And call return, that's basically just like return, except for coroutines. Uh, the reason we cannot use regular return is because title is QString, but the return type of our function is something else. So that wouldn't match. So in fact, what call return does is it sort of calls something like task dot set return value or something like that and passes it the title. Anyway, look at the call wait keyword. So in this case, what we do is we do the, regular, the dbus call like we did before. We convert it to qdbus reply, and then we pass the qdbus reply to the call wait keyword. Now, what does the call wait keyword do? The call wait keyword uh, will trigger a bunch of code that's hidden behind that, partially generated by compiler, partially provided by the coroutine library developer, in this case, me. So what the call wait keyword, it will look at the qdbus reply, and it will say, huh, the QDBus reply is not finished yet. I don't have the result yet. So what it will do is it will suspend the coroutine. Suspending the coroutine means that it will take snapshot of all the local states, so all the local variables and an instruction pointer and, and some other stuff. It will take the snapshot and save it somewhere in the memory. And then, then, then it will return to the caller of this function. So even though the function has not finished yet, it hasn't reached the end, we are already returning to the caller and saving the intermediate state somewhere in the memory. So now let's look at what the caller might look like. We might have a caller that looks like this. It's a simple function called player widget update. And the player widget update, what it does, it calls the remote player get title, uh, which, gets a type, which should get the title using the uh, coroutines, or it's a coroutine, right? And we know that it's a coroutine, so it might return early, right? We know that it might return early because the dbus response is not ready. But then we need, we want the, the response here, we want the title. So we need to await again for that coroutine to finish. So we have like two nested coroutines. So what happens when we call remote player get title? It will get suspended, it will return the task, the qcoro task in some unfinished state. And the call await keyword here, this call wait keyword will look at the task and will say, well, the task is not finished, so I will just suspend this coroutine and return to the caller. And then the caller might be as well call waiting this coroutine and so on and so on. They would be chaining up until it reaches a point where either someone blocks and waits until it is finished, or they don't care that the, it's a coroutine and it will just continue doing something else. So, and this is important, this fact that it always returns to the caller means that well, we can have this executed from the event loop. And whenever the coroutine is suspends itself, it means that the execution will return back into the event loop. So as long, so while the coroutine is being is, is suspended, waiting for a network reply or a dbus reply, we might we can have uh, our event loop perfectly looping. Let's look at this diagram. Uh, this is state-of-the-art presentation painting. Uh, event loop. Uh, let's say it's cute event loop. It can be any event loop, but let's assume it's cute event loop. And this blue bar indicates that the event loop is running, right? It's doing its stuff, it's event looping. 
And now at some point, for some reason, it decides to call the player widget update function. Uh, it could be a timer or any other reason. Simply it calls uh, player widget update. So player widget update starts running, right? And the event loop is blocked. It's not running. That's uh, that's why, why it's lighter right here. We can't have both things running at the same time. One function called another function. So the execution is now here. And if you remember the function update called the get title function, so the execution moves forward further down here. And then if you remember the function get title, it does, it called dbus call, so it, that sends some dbus message out and immediately, almost immediately returned back. So we are back in get title. Now what's next in get title was the co wait keyword, right? So we are now in the co wait keyword that the red box down there and the co wait keyword looks at the dbus response and it says, well, the response is not ready yet. So I will suspend get title and I will return execution to my caller, which was player widget update. So now the execution is back in player widget update. If you remember, player widget update was co waiting on the get title coroutine as well. So here we have the co wait again. The co wait looks at the get title. And it says, well, the get title task is not finished yet, so I will suspend myself as well and return to, to, the, to my caller. So now the player widget update is suspended as well, and the execution is back in the event loop. And now the event loop is happily running, processing your events, your UI is you know, reacting to user input and so on, while these two functions are suspended. Right? Their state is state saved somewhere in the memory. They are not actually being executed. Is the event loop that's running. And now suddenly, let's not go into details how that happens, but let's assume that when the dbus reply arrives finally to your application, it somehow gets triggered from the event loop, goes into some magical dbus handler, and the dbus handler sets the response as finished. And remember, there is a coroutine that is bound to that, uh, to that uh, response. So what happens? The coroutine is awakened. So the coroutine is awakened. We are now in the get title coroutine, which was waiting for the dbus response. The coroutine does something, uh, whatever was after the co-await keyword. So that was assigning into queue string and then co-returning that queue string back to its caller. So the next step, it returns the, the title to its caller, which was player widget update. Player widget update might do some other stuff with that title, you know, set it as a title on some label or whatnot. And then it reaches its end. And it finishes. So the execution now, this is weird, it doesn't necessarily return to the event loop because player widget update was called from the event loop. It returns back to get title, and then from get title, it returns back to the dbus handler because the dbus handler is the one who actually resumed the coroutine. Right? So the execution after resuming follows from the one who resumed them. Finally, the dbus handler is finished and it returns back to the event loop, and the event loop continues event looping happily. So this is somewhat what happens when you use coroutines, right? When you find a place where you sort of want to wait for a, uh, for a probe for some, for some uh, operation asynchronously, but you don't want to rewrite your entire code base to be asynchronous, you can just use code wait. And it's not that simple, but we'll get to that later. Uh, here is uh, the same graph only if the dbus call was blocking, right? If we, if we did the right, what, basically the thing that we had in the original uh, snippet, which was waiting in a blocking manner for the response to arrive. If you compare that, when we are waiting in a blocking manner, the event loop is not running at all the whole time, while with coroutines, the event loop is executing most of the time. Uh, those blocks are actually not proportional to the actual execution time. So in reality, it would be mostly dark blue and a very little, very small, you know, very, the, the times when the event loop is not running or is blocked would be much smaller than this even. So here you can see that uh, by using coroutines without actually changing the code, right? We just throw in a few keywords and magically our code does not block the event loop anymore. So now let's look at it. Now, let, let's look at coroutines uh, a bit more in general. Uh, you may have heard about coroutines before if you use some other languages. Coroutines are common in Python, JavaScript, uh, Kotlin, uh, Go, Rust. They seem all to have coroutines. It almost sounds like C++ is last to the party, but it's, it's not. Anyway, coroutine is a function. Uh, it can be suspended at any point. 
and then resumed again from that point where it was suspended. When the coroutine is suspended, the execution returns to its caller, which we just shown. And when a uh, coroutine is resumed, it's resumed as if it was called from the function that has resumed it. Uh, we've shown that as well with the weird dbus uh, handler sort of calling the function, right? Uh, suspended function. What's most important for me about coroutines is that coroutines allow you to write asynchronous code in synchronous manner. That means no, you don't need callback hell. You don't need you know 15 different signal slots and then lots of connections between them. It allows you to write a code as if it were synchronous, and then you just throw a code wait keyword here and there, and magically your code doesn't block the event loop, and it's asynchronous. Worth a warning, though, it does not mean that it will improve your performance. It will not make your application faster. It might help make your application more responsive, but coroutines will not make your application faster. The reason is that uh, uh, not necessarily, of, of course, uh, but in most cases, the, the, the overhead of suspending and resuming uh, coroutines is, is, is small, but there is some, right? So, you know, if you co-wait for a network request, a network reply here and there, and then, you know, you co-wait some DBus, DBus request here and there, it's not measurable. The impact is not measurable, but, you know, if you would do this in a tight loop, then, yeah, that there would be a measurable slowdown because of the, the overhead of uh, suspending and resuming the coroutines. So coroutines in C++. In C++, uh, coroutines, uh, coroutines were introduced in C++20, so in the last version. It's perfectly fine, supported by GCC and MSVC in, in, in latest versions. Uh, Clank, 5, Clank is a bit problematic, so it's in, in a way it's supported for a long time since Clank 5, but Clank still supports only the technical specification. They still consider their implementation of coroutines to be experimental. So that makes it kind of difficult because in, if, you use GC, if you write your code to be portable to both our compilers, then in, for GCC, you, everything is in, in the namespace stud, in the, in the stud namespace, while then in Clang, everything is in the, in the stood experimental namespace. So you need to do some type, some, some magic with macros usually to get it working. The biggest disadvantage is that because it's experimental in Clang, it only works with the LLVM libc++ standard library, right? You can't use Clang and the standard GNU libstd c++ and coroutines. That doesn't, doesn't fly, right? And this becomes problematic when you try to use coroutines with uh, with some distribution provided packages because distributions, Linux distributions usually use the uh, GCC standard library, like the libstd C++, while if you try to use Clang and you try build your application with coroutines and with libc++, there might be uh, con uh, symbol problems because libc++ and still libc++ are not compatible uh, on the ABI level. Uh, what's interesting is that in C20, they, uh, the, the, the committee, they actually introduced mostly just the, the it, it was mostly the language extension. They introduced the keywords and described the machinery that's supposed to be hidden behind those keywords. And the, but what they did is they, they uh, only specified the bare minimum tools in the standard library that are needed by compiler developers to be able to implement coroutines in compilers. And for library writers, we want to write coroutine libraries, right? It's not like there are no uh, ready-made, you know, thing uh, like tasks. For instance, that you see the key coro ret the task a return type. There is no such thing in the standard library that you could just start using immediately as a as a programmer. Uh, the reason is that the the idea was that the committee introduced all the tooling that's necessary to to write coroutine libraries. And then they let the wider community to actually come up with some implementations so that we can see how coroutines are used in the real world in production, how, what is the best approach. And then hopefully in the next version of C++ or the version after, there will be some proposals to standardize one or two different approaches uh, to coroutines so that after then, uh, regular developers can just come, uh, include the coroutine header, and start using you know coroutines out of the box with the standard library. For now, that's not possible. You need to write lots of the machinery, or you need to write the glue uh, that that can that can be used between user code and the machinery for uh, the machinery of coroutines uh, in the language. Um, 
So what has been introduced into C++ really? There are three new keywords, co-wait, co-return, and co-yield. The co underscore prefix is there to avoid conflict with uh, some other uh, libraries that even before there were official coroutines in C++, there were various implementations using threads and, and light threads. Uh, in, for instance, in Boost or other libraries, and they have created macros called evade and uh, yield, for instance, uh, so that this was this would, this would clash. So the, the, they decided instead to use the co underscore uh, prefix to make sure that this doesn't clash with some existing implementations of coroutines in C++. Uh, the keywords, what they do, co await, we already saw, co await suspends the, the coroutine and returns execution to, uh, to the caller. Uh, co-return allows us to return a value from a coroutine. It's basically like return it, just for coroutines. And then the interesting thing that uh, I haven't dug very deep into yet, but that's co-yield, which basically allows us to return repeatedly values from a function without the function actually ending, right? You, normally, when you when you return a value from a function, the function ends. But with co-yield, you can actually return the value repeatedly whenever someone asks for it without uh, ending the function. This is useful for writing uh, generators. Uh, in the standard library, we have a uh, few things. This is not exhaustive, but there are only really like one or two more things that I didn't mention here. Uh, first is the std coroutine handler handle, which is a class that is a handle for coroutine, really, as the name says. Uh, it allows resuming the coroutine, and internally it holds pointers to where the stack is saved and where the instruction pointer and some other stuff. And then there are suspend never, suspend always helpers, which Allow to, uh, which allow the coroutine to indicate uh, whether it should or should not suspend and when it should or should not suspend. Uh, this is customizable. So a coroutine, for instance, can decide when it's called, it can decide to immediately suspend itself and then only start executing the user code at the moment that someone co starts co waiting that coroutine. Right? Other coroutines can decide to start immediately executing the user code and then they run, run, run. And well, when someone co waits them, they might already get the result. So, so and the suspend never suspend always allows to control this behavior. So, how do you make a coroutine in C? Well, first, you must use one of the keywords co wait or co yield. Uh, if you read the, the C standard, just adding the, one of those two keywords into the, into the code magically makes it coroutine by definition, though it will not compile yet. The coroutine must have a special return type. The special return type or well, the return type is special because it must have a type def called promise underscore type, which uh, well is a type def to some particular class, uh, to some class which must in implement some sort of promise interface. Uh, this has nothing to do with with std promise or std future, right? It's just the the, the naming is similar. The, the the idea is the same. So uh, there must be uh, some promise type. Usually the return type looks something like you know this task temp task t where t is the actual type of the value you want to return, so q string or integer. Uh, and the way I think about it is the task is like the, the interface for the caller. That's what the caller of the coroutine sees, while the promise type is what is used internally within the coroutine. Uh, the problem is that, and that's what I mentioned initially, is that there is no such return type already defined in the standard library, right? So you need to write it yourself first. And in order to be able to write this, uh, return type, you need to understand coroutines a bit more in depth uh, before you can just start using them, which uh, is why it's not so easy to get into coroutines immediately. And of course, uh, you must use coroutine instead of returns, return when you have a coroutine. So now, um, one thing that you might be, might be wondering is, uh, this is back to one of slide five or six. Um, when we had this code, and I said, well, we have the QD bus reply, and then we pass it to, to co wait. And co wait looks at the dbus reply and it says, well, the dbus reply is not finished. I will suspend the coroutine. And I said, what? Does C magically know about Qt? Does C understand QD bus reply? No, it's, it's, it's not like that. It's not that easy. There has to be some point, some integration point, right? Someone must have told what, how to figure out that QD bus reply is finished or not. And that someone is uh, the coroutine library developer. In this case, the library that I use is, uh, oh, well, I will, I will get to that. But the way it works is basically the co await keyword requires uh, an argument which is of a particular type. And 
the type must either already implement an interface, which is called awaitable, or it's, it's like a concept rather. So having a few few functions that uh, the co-wait keyword will use to figure out, okay, is it finished yet or not, or should I suspend, and how should I suspend? Or if you remember the promise type from the return from the previous slide, from the return type of the of the of the coroutine, if there is a function called await transform transform overloaded on that promise type for that particular type T. So for instance, in our case for the QD bus reply, then the co-await will call this await transport function and it expects that in return it will get some sort of an awaitable again. Right? So this basically, since the promise type is bound to the return type, it's bound to the it's bound to the return type of the coroutine, so task in this case. This means that if you pick the right return type, so you can provide the uh, await transform overload for any type you want to support. So in this case, I have a little library that provides QCoro task as a class that implements the available interface. And internally, it has the promise type defined to some custom class. And this class has a await transform overload specified for all different queues types, including QD bus reply. So that's how CoAwait learns about QD bus reply, how, how, how it is able to determine that uh, whether QD bus reply is finished or not. The library is, surprise, surprise, I call it QCoro, and it's a small library uh, which provides custom available return type for coroutines, which th that's the QCoro task. Uh, this QCoro task has the await transform implementation for various queues types where it makes sense to have some, which have some asynchronous implement, uh, some asynchronous operation that makes sense to wait for. And it also provides some thin wrappers that provide various uh, asynchronous uh, operations for different types as well. Uh, I'll, I'll explain that in an example. So here, uh, for some types, I call these types like explicitly awaitable. Those are types that uh, they really have only one thing that makes sense to be uh, awaited, which, for instance, in uh, we have Q future here. Uh, Q future really has only one thing that you may want to asynchronously wait for, and that's the Q future finishing, right? So in this case, what we have here is a queue concurrent run. Uh, Qt concurrent run is basically what it does. It, it starts this uh, lambda in a, in, a, in a thread, immediately returns a queue future, and then eventually when the thread finishes, the queue future will be finished and it will provide the, the, the result to the caller. Uh, when you use queue coro, so if the, if the coroutine returns queue coro task, you can just put co wait in there and magically uh, the call wait will know how to deal with queue future and it will be able to wait asynchronously again for the queue future to finish. And while it's waiting, the curtain is suspended and you are possibly running in an event loop. So you have, can have this nice asynchronous code, uh, sorry, synchronous like looking code written in an asynchronous way. You don't need to use queue future watcher and this kind of stuff. Uh, same goes with queue network reply. Really, queue network reply has just one thing that you usually want to wait for, and that's the reply being finished. Although Q network reply is also a QIO device, which on its own has some interesting things, you, some interesting asynchronous operations. I'll show that later. So here we create a network access manager, we call get, and because again, Q coro task has an overload for Q network reply pointer, you can just shove co wait in, her, in here and magically this will suspend your coroutine and asynchronously resume when the reply is finished and it will return the reply again. Of course, you don't have to always just put co wait immediately before the operation. What you could do here, you could take the reply pointer and then you could do some more stuff like query the database and then do some computation. And then finally, when you reach the point where you really already need the, the response from the server, that's where you start co-waiting, right? So you can also use it the way that you fire off a nice cross request, then you do some processing. And then when you reach a point where you need the data from the response, then you start co-waiting this. So it, is, it also allows, some, allows for some level of parallelism which is nice. Um, here is a more complex example with queue process. Uh, queue process has multiple things that make sense to be co-weighted. It has multiple asynchronous operations. Uh, for this case, QCoro has a, a simple wrapper function called QCoro, where you just put a process, queue pro when you pass it a queue process and it returns a, a thin wrapper class called QCoro process. 
and uh, this class implements part of the the, the interface of uh, key process, but it implements it in a way that you can again uh, use co-weight with it. So in this case, you just start key, uh, some some process, and then you asynchronously wait for the process to start. Then you write something in it, and then again you asynchronously wait for the process to finish. So you have a beautiful block of code in a single place that's easier to read, easier to navigate. You know, you don't have to do any mental exercises about jumping through different functions or having nested lambdas and 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 stuff. And but just by using uh, coroutines, this allows you to actually uh, to to not block your your main thread. Uh, I think this is the ultimate example that I have where that's also support for QTCP server, QTCP socket, uh, where we have a uh, we have a wrapper for QTCP server where we can co-await new connections. So this will suspend the coroutine until a new connection is available. And then again, when the connection comes, it uh, resumes the coroutine and then again waits until the socket has anything to read. And then ultimately it just reads the data and sends them back with Pong before it. So it's a simple Pong server. The thing is that this has a while loop, right? It's sort of an end, basically an endless while loop, and it, it seems like there's a lot of blocking. But in fact, you could just put this code into your main thread, and your application would not get blocked, right? Because whenever this needs to wait, the call wait would just suspend the coroutine and eventually chain up all the way to to your event loop, right? Uh, this is a list of all the classes that are supported right now. I showed some of them. There is also queue timer support, so you can call wait the timer to timeout. You can co-await any arbitrary signal emission, uh, and there's general support for QIO device as well. So that's that. Uh, that was a quick introduction to coroutines and uh, QCoro. If you are interested more in uh, the QCoro library, there is a GitHub repository, github.com slash danbratio slash QCoro, or you can read the documentation here. Or if you have any questions about uh, coroutines or uh, the library, just hit me an email, Twitter, or uh, Matrix. Thank you. Let's all give Daniel a big round of applause. I see everyone's going to be clapping in the chat. Um, so going through some questions. Jan asks, have you tried debugging and reading the stack traces of coroutines? So if you have a crash, what happens in GDB? Yes, it's, 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 it's horribly annoying because uh, because uh, the support in the tooling is not there yet, so you see, uh, you see random. Uh, there is a lot of generated code and generated frames, and these are really hard to debug. Yeah, so debugging crashes are um, debugging crashes and, and memory leaks, especially. That's it's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so annoying is the answer. So the next question, which I think you just touched on at the end, is does this work out for work out of the box for code that is based on signals and slots, like KJob, or do we need to do anything there to make it co-weight compatible? Uh, you don't need to make you don't need to modify the classes to to make them compatible with coroutines. Uh, I did not patch anything in Qt. What you need to do is you need to introduce uh, a wrapper. Uh, and uh, into the QCoro library, possibly, that uh, that can handle KJob and then uh, tell the coroutines machinery when to suspend, when to resume. The QCoro is written in a way that it should be possible to even add support for things like KJob without having to patch QCoro even. You just need to provide some template specializations, and it should work. So I haven't tried yet, but it should work. That sounds amazing. David is just writing reply now. Um, so I'll ask one more question. One of the biggest challenges of asynchronous code is managing the lifespan of all the objects that you're going to use in your callbacks and in your Lambda. And your, all your examples you used earlier, like Python and Dart, they just reference everything. So this is a big problem in C++. How do you resolve this nicely in C++ and Qt? Well, this is what the coroutines really solve for you, right? Because whenever you suspend the coroutine, the whole stack is saved to memory. So you don't need to, and, and then it's resumed, everything is restored, and then you use the regular, like, you know, whenever you lead, whenever you, uh, whenever you return from the function, it uh, destroys everything, right? So the memory, you, you suddenly can start allocating many things on stack 
because you don't have to bother, you don't have to be worried that your function will finish and then you need to capture everything into Lambda, connect it to some signal or, or passing it to another function, right? So this actually, I think, makes things not only much easier, but it also allows us to write much safer code because you can allocate everything on stack, so no memory leaks. Yeah, for maybe user interfaces where people are closing things. OK, um, well, we've got one more question, and we've got time for it. Uh, Ingo asks, is it possible to cancel your update, e.g. if the next title is needed from your original example with Dbus? Uh, uh, you can, well, if you have some other code that's executing and that, that would cancel the bus message, then the the the, the message would be the, the reply would finish, and it would the the, the code team would be resumed, and then you would have to have some error handling. So in a way, yes, yes. Though it's not as straightforward this code. The code I showed that doesn't really bother with error checking because no, errors don't happen, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and how does this interact with a CPP colo compatibility or extension? Uh, I, I haven't tr uh, tried. The problem is that uh, I, 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 inspired, I found a lot of inspiration in CPP colo. Uh, but the thing is, you, it depends on the return type, right? So you cannot like mix things from CPP colo and Q colo in a single colo team. So th this will become a bit tricky, uh, which is one of the weaknesses, I think, of the current approach to coroutines that you, you have to pick one library and then basically stick to it throughout your code base. OK, one more question. I do keep coming in. Uh, now, how does this relate to standard future and standard promise? I think you touched on this a little bit in your slides. Not, none at all, none at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, is no, short answer. There, there is no threading involved, right? You can use threads. But this, you can call away the thread, but there is inherently no threading in coroutines. Cool. And I assume you're around for our academy to answer questions as they come in? Sure. <laughs> sure. Cool. OK, the next talk is in three minutes. I will pass off to, to Ivan to be your next session host. So please stay in room two. Thank you. Bye. Unless you want to see a talk in room one, of course.